So we started in 2002. Uh, earlier this year, the requisite hardware became available. Our first reading machine, I developed the first reading machine for the blind in 1976, was the size of a washing machine. And just a couple months ago, we introduced this four ounce reading machine, which I'll demonstrate for you. Ready? You find it. And uh, I'll read a document from the conference. Taking picture. So a blind person can just snap a picture of signs on a wall, Article bank ATM picture. displays. Articles and labels for that. Bank ATM displays, it, it'll rotate the image. One degrees clockwise relative to the page. Thinking digital. I don't know if you Thinking can see that. Thinking digital conference is an annual event where outstanding individuals gather to take part in it. Exclusive conversation about technology, ideas, and our future. In May 2008, the Thinking Digital Conference will take on an eclectic range of technology-based topics that have, or soon will have, a profound effect upon the way we work and live. From the future of media and making far better use of technology, to our obsession with happiness and creating a cure for aging. The Thinking So, and it's... Please wait. It displays on the screen what it's reading with synchronized highlighting, so a dyslexic student can actually read uh, what, what is being read and hear it at the same time. We have research that shows that, that actually boosts their reading skills. So there are now uh, over a thousand blind guys and gals and dyslexic individuals using this to read the print as they go through the day. Other companies have noticed, oh, cell phones are powerful enough to do this. They're starting their research now. Maybe they'll do it more quickly than we did. It took us six years, but uh, we have a jump on the market because we were able to anticipate where technology would be. It's a little bit like skeet shooting. You can't shoot where the skeet is in the air when you pull the trigger. And technology is moving quickly enough, and Ian gave you quite a few examples, uh, that the world will be very different uh, as we go through uh, a technology or, or business development program. So we actually make a discipline of writing out exactly what the underlying technology of our projects will be in January 2009, July 2009, January 2010. We used to do it every two years, now we, then we did it every one year. Now we find that things like cell phone technology change radically in six months' time. And this is actually quite predictable. The common wisdom is we can't predict the future. But I'm going to show you examples of just how amazingly predictable certain aspects of technology are, particularly when you can measure the key underlying information properties of that technology. And you might wonder, well, how could that be? I mean, if specific projects are unpredictable, if we can't tell what the next wireless standard will be, will it be CDMA, G3, G4, WiMAX, uh, how can we predict the overall impact, the price performance of computing, or the number of bits being moved around on the internet, or the number of nodes on the internet, or the amount of bytes of data, brain data, uh, and so on. Uh, well, we see other examples of predictable results in science coming from a process that's basically chaotic, where each element is unpredictable. The classical example actually comes from the 19th century, thermodynamics, which models a gas as a chaotic system where each element, each molecule, is completely unpredictable, so you can't tell where this molecule will be 10 seconds from now. But the overall properties of the gas are very predictable to a very high degree of precision according to the laws of thermodynamics. So if you have a large, dynamic, chaotic, random system, you can make certain predictions very accurately. And technology development is just such a dynamic system. And I'm going to show you just how remarkably predictable that is. And we should, and not only is it predictable, but it's exponential. And people think linearly. Ian said the only constant uh, now is change. I would quibble with that and say that change is not a constant. Change is accelerating, and I'm sure Ian would agree with that. Uh, but actually, our intuition is linear. We, we, intelligence is really a, a function of being able to make predictions about what will happen. But our intuition is linear. So when we were walking through the savanna a thousand years ago and we saw something coming at us through the corner of our eye, we would make a linear prediction about where that animal would be in 20 seconds and that would actually work quite well. 
So our, our intuition is that change is, is linear. And I have these debates all the time. Uh, a scientist will see the amount of progress that's been made in the last year, and if, if a certain goal seems 10 times that, they'll say it'll take 10 years, or 100 years if it's 100 times that. I was at a conference recently organized by Time Magazine in the United States on the future of life. This was on the 50th anniversary of the discovery of the structure of DNA, and we were all asked, what will the next 50 years bring? All the speakers there based the next 50 years on the last 50 years, but that's wrong. We're doubling the paradigm shift rate every 10 years. We'll see 32 times more progress in the next 50 years as we did in the last 50 years. So uh, the uh, Jim Watson, the discoverer of DNA himself, said, oh, in 50 years we'll have drugs that enable you to eat as much as you want and remain slim. And I said, Jim, we've already done that in animals by blocking the fat insulin receptor gene. We'll have that in 10 years, not 50 years. All of the predictions there were very overly conservative by failing to take this exponential growth into account. We are now doubling the, the power for the same price of information technology in computers, communications, uh, biological technologies every year. Doubling every year means multiplying by a thousand in 10 years, a million in 20 years, a billion in 30 years, and because of the there's actually acceleration in the rate of acceleration. It'll be 25 years for a billion-fold increase in the power of these technologies. And people think linearly. If you count to 30 linearly, you get to 30. If you count exponentially, 2, 4, 8, 16, you get to a billion. It makes a very big difference. And so let me show you how predictable this is, how explosive it is. And we're already at a very steep point of the exponential, and I think that that point came out very clearly from Ian's remarks. And it also pertains not just to devices that we carry around in our pockets. It's going to transform everything we care about. For example, our health. Health, medicine, biology, it didn't used to be in information technology. As of just a few years ago, it was hit or miss. Drug development was called drug discovery. And we would just look for things that happen to work. Oh, here's something that lowers blood pressure. We don't know, really know why this works, but it seems to work. Invariably, these found tools had lots of side effects. We're now actually able to understand, or at least we're in the early stages of this process, our biological processes as information processes. We have software programs called genes, 23,000 of them, running inside our bodies. I mean, when's the last time you updated the, your software on your cell phone? It's probably a few weeks ago. When's the last time you updated the software running in your body? It was about you know, 10,000 years ago. And conditions are very different now. Uh, for example, this fat insulin receptor gene I just mentioned, that basically says, hold on to every calorie because the next hunting season may not work out so well. That was a great idea 1,000 years ago because calories were few and far between and you worked all day to get them. Today, we live in an era of abundance that underlies an epide epidemic of obesity. When the fat insulin receptor gene was blocked in animals, uh, a few miles from where I'm speaking at the Jolison Diabetes Center, these animals ate ravenously and remained slim. And it wasn't a fake slimness. They didn't get diabetes. They didn't get heart disease. They lived 20% longer. They got the health benefits of caloric restriction while doing the opposite. And there are five pharmaceutical companies now rushing to bring fat insulin receptor gene inhibitors to the human market. And we have a new technology that just emerged a few years ago called RNA interference that can turn genes off. So we have, we have the genome. We have the, the ability to block genes that promote disease. We have new forms of gene therapy where we can actually add new genes, not just to a baby, but to a, an adult. We have the means of turning on and off enzymes. We can simulate biology. We're basically in an era where we can treat biology as a set of software processes. And the significance of that is it's now subject to, to the law of accelerating returns. It's no longer a linear hit or miss process. These technologies, which are really in the early stages, will be a million times more powerful in the next 20 years.